Uh, oh, and by the way, thanks to all the guys that have uh, been messaging us privately, um, A, for advice, and B, um, to give us advice, which is always nice. So we decided that we were going to do a QA. and a You know, we've said this, we've got endless amounts of topics to talk about, but what is it that you want to see? So we thought we'd see out there and have a mixed bag and see where people go. And to be honest, a lot of the questions that have come through are more about experience and gaining more and decision making um, and, and where we would go. You know, that tends to be where the majority, as in the ball of questions, there's not too much out there of what is Class G airspace or how does this work. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, can't reiterate it enough, you can't actually beat training with an instructor, whether it be on a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one. So certainly if you're involved with the flying school, and I certainly recommend that you would stay associated with your flying schools, that it's always a good source of information. Don't rely on these armchair experts that can't wait to impart their wisdom. I'm doing, I hate people, I hate people who do that. What? Inverted commas as they're talking. Do you? Wisdom. Is it? Why? Anyway, so yeah, don't rely on the armchair. Really? Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> uh, the armchair experts that just love to shout louder and talk you down. There is actual, so it takes 30 seconds to do a very quick Google search. Message people, you can message me, Andy. There are an infinite number of people who actually know what they're talking about. So don't just rely on. Just Back to HPPL. Uh, HPL, in that uh, the wrong knowledge is more dangerous than no knowledge. Um, okay, right, so we were going to do a Q&A, questions and answers, and we have had some in. It's been quite nice to receive them. So shall we make a start? Yes, yeah, so let's do it. Are you guys yeah. sitting comfortably? Are you ready? How many have we got on, Barry? Many, 65 lines. 65, fantastic. Oh, okay. Bear with me. <coughs> okay, right. so the first question came in, and this is a me and you question, to be honest. Uh, from Graham Daniel. I used to fly flex wings 10 years ago due to building my own house. I needed the money and sold my flex wing. Now I want to get back into flying and looking at what options are out there. I uh, would love to go uh, take up gyrocoptering. That's expensive. But don't have the funds. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but that would be my ultimate dream. I have uh, bought a paramotor and wing and was meant to do my training in Spain until lockdown. My question is, does any of my licenses count for anything if I got back into flex wings? And as paramotor is limited to perfect weather, disagree, I'm making the right choice or should I chase my dreams and make me very, very poor? Well, there's a licenses issue there first. We'll answer that. the last bit very quickly. <laughs> Welcome to aviation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One, always... way to one, one, one way to make a small fortune out of aviation Start with a big one and work your way through it. So, yeah. Okay, so <coughs> the first part of that question is the licensing question. Now, the license that you are issued, unless it's taken from you, is valid for life. Um, however, the restrictions are only permitted within the validity period. Uh, if you took your test in 2010, you would be on the modern NPPL uh, M. Um, National Private Pilots Licence, Microlites, meaning that you would need to uh, be revalidated um, every two years. If your licence hasn't been revalidated, the only way of revalidating it would be to do a GST or GFT, basically a, a flying skills test. Um, go to your local school or come to us, whichever you prefer, uh, and you will go on basically a check ride, which is what I tend to do with people who are coming back in, and see where they're at. Your instructor will then discuss with you um, any further training um, and where you have maybe some issues, up to the point of getting you through your test. Once you pass your test, your licence will then be uh, reissued. Uh, you don't need to do a full MPPL course again. But then you also mentioned about that you bought a paramotor and, and a wing. Uh, um, yeah, and that you'd actually booked a course. <clears throat> so, when lockdown ends, uh, why not go and do your course? Why not go and do your course? Learn some, even if you don't complete that course due to weather or whatever, uh, go and learn a new skill. And I've, so, I've heard, you know, everyone here is, is usually multi skilled or, or fly, you know, they're by Wingle. So they, they fly many different types of aircraft. I like that. Which is, yeah, Bob Wingle. Yeah. 
Um, so go out there and and learn to fly a power motor. There's pros and cons to power motoring. You don't need perfect weather to fly a power motor. Yes, it can be more limited in wing conditions than a flex wing, definitely than a fixed wing aircraft. But well, so, you so can a flex wing, can't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. The, every aircraft has its limitations. So we fly for so, fun. Yeah. So we, we aren't commercial pilots, and unless you're an instructor, you're not really flying. <coughs> so yeah, but if. You know, the, the advantage of power motoring is once you know how to look, fly a power motor or paraglider with a motor on, I should say, once you know how to fly a paraglider with a motor on, then you can come home from work in the evenings when you're not for long anymore, and you can go out into a field somewhere that you've got permission to fly from, and you can be out and you can be flying within 20 minutes. You haven't got to go to your local airfield, get your plane out. So you can go for a nice fly around the sky, Land, go home, have your tea, have a beer, happy days, isn't it? Then, you know, so there's a lot of pros and cons to any form of aviation, but one of the big pros is very convenient. Mm. I, and I'd say it's one of the kit. Yeah, if you've got the kit, go, then why not? You know, go and use it. I, I would say paramotor is probably one of the cheapest for, I wouldn't say cheap, cheap in aviation that we've <coughs> together, but it's certainly you've got no anger like, yeah. yeah. you've got no. Permits, there's uh -huh. once you've got your insurance, your training, you know. Your insurance you can get if you're BHPA qualified, you can get your insurance through yeah. BHPA, it's £126 a year, uh, and you're insured, you know, that's, that's, that is a cheap form of insurance. Paramotive so, is the hot ticket. The and and if you get your MPPL back, and you are a BHPA member, you are third party insured to fly a micro line yeah. as well. Ah, two for one. Yeah, send your license, current license in to the BHPA office and you are third party insured to fly a micro under as long as you uh, meet Just the, going the, on the from license. that, we've got Peter Kelsey. What's the license called for a power motor? For, there isn't one. It's, it's deregulated. There's no, there's no it's a a power motor, is classified as a glider. There's no licensing for gliders. So whether it be a paraglider, power motor, hang glider, powered hang glider, deregulated, um, sailplane, big wings, psh, flies around. Yeah, there is no licensing. It is not a licensed aircraft. What you do need is insurance. Yeah. And it's a BHPA rating that gets you that insurance. No, you can get insurance from other places. Mm. If you want to be insured if, if you, with if you, BHPA. If you want to be insured with a BHPA, you have to hold. You have to hold either be under training with a BHPA registered school, so you're under training with them, or uh, be at least club pilot level, and then you're you're insured as long as you stay within the insured regulations that are offered. So as long as you stay within what is offered from the BHPA and their insurers. If you move out of that you become uninsured. A bit like uh, driving your car with no MOT. If you look at your insurance policy, yeah, that car must be, have an MOT for you to be insured. So even though you've paid for your insurance, you're not insured because your car's out of MOT. So you must stay within that. And they, I mean, they could set whatever parameters they want. Well, the insurers do. They, yeah. they, they, all insurers set whatever parameters yeah. they so want. It's not a uh, say a, <clears throat> a paramotor thing per se, or a deregulated thing. No, it's a, a no. If you, in, what the if you yeah, need in, in order to use their insurance. The, the other one that uh, people use is AXA, <clears throat> and I don't know about the AXA insurance, but they will have uh, parameters that you must be within to actually. If you read the small print, yeah, that you must be within to actually it, qualify for their insurance. Insurance companies pay. don't want a risk. No, <laughs> you know, they, they don't. Insurance companies want to take the money. <laughs> they they, they just want to take your money. They don't want to pay out. So you know. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is Giles' question. They obviously can't wait to have answered. What? Um, progression. Uh, yeah, maybe more of a question for Andy. Discuss wing progression and when stroke should I do an SIV uh, course? Yes. Uh, and then pilot progression, getting pilot rated. What should be the focus? This is you. I'm. I. Are you not pilot rated right already, Jules? I think he's still <coughs> seventy, isn't he? Did he paramotor in? And... No, he did paramotor, didn't you? I thought. I thought you got the fastest so up and down. Discussing record. wing progression. Discuss wing progression. And when stroke should I do? I presume we're discussing wing progression within paragliders or paramotors 
or in hang gliders or in fixed wing aircraft or in gliders. <coughs> Let's go for paragliders. Let's go for paragliders. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. So paragliders. Yeah. You get A wings, Bs, Cs, Ds, and so forth. Boom. Up to up to prototypes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> A's, B's, C's, D's, no, it's no use messaging me Giles, I'm not looking at my phone. A's, B's, C's, <laughs> D's, up to prototypes. Um, so, and within that, you also get that within free flying wings and also within paramotor wings. Okay. A lot of people, a lot of people will never go past this. Some people have got this, or in between, but I've still got one of these. I know a couple of people that have got this in in between. <laughs> and for good reason. Some people go into these, they want to go to competition. Yeah, and some people fly prototypes. Where, when should you move forward? So forth. You can, under the HPA, we can, as a school, sell you a A wing or a B wing. And okay. teach on those as well. And we can teach on those as well. We teach on A wings, and we teach on at the minute on the Atom, which is the most mundane and safest of all the wings, uh, and and very forgiving. So we teach Atoms. Uh, most of our parts go on to the, either Mojo or Mojo Power. Some want to go on to a Roaster, which is a B. There's pros and cons to this. The if we take it back, let's take it back 10 years, 15 years. 10, 15 years ago, this wing and this wing, yeah, this wing tried to chuck you out the sky every moment it could, yeah, 15 years ago, a C wing or a D wing. They were absolutely bloody awful. <laughs> and, you know, they were, but the manufacturers were pushing the limits of what they can do and that's what manufacturers do because they're one wing competitions and, and they want to progress the sport. All manufacturers want to do that. If you took this wing or this wing of 15 years ago <coughs> and you took an A wing now and put them against each other, that wing will outperform them wings of 15 years ago. And that's yeah. in glide, glide angle and speed? Glide angle, speed, yeah. Definitely. I mean, in, in performance, if you like. In handling, there, there is no familiarities whatsoever. Yeah? This, this wing handles itself. This wing, even today, are uh, awkward and can become very emotional at times to fly. <laughs> yeah? The emotion, it can get very emotional flying a wing like this. It can get emotional flying one of them. get really emotional <laughs> flying one of them. Yeah? <clears throat> so, the answer is, for a lot of people, they never want to move from an A, they might move into a B. I didn't realise, I was only through talking with Barry, I, again my naivety, I thought an A wing was a, tr I'm doing it again, a yeah. training wing, and it's not. No, no it's not. A's aren't you, training wings, they're your first wing. Yeah, manufacturers produce wings for, specifically for schools, for training. But even those wings, those atoms that we're training on now, without former BC, or 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it outperformed them. Yeah, the, the performance, we're, we're, the age we're living in now is so good, we're lucky to be in the sport now because the sport has developed over the past 25 years to a point where we've got great A wings. And the B wings have become, so the handling of the wings has become so much better. Yeah, the performance of these has become so much better, but there's, you still, have to realise that you're flying a D, and you soon will. As soon as you take off, you will know you're flying a D wing. Yeah, they they're not for everyone. So the yeah, simple answer to that is, I know somebody that has got a high MB sort of C wing, a Rush. Yeah, um, who actually flies out in the Alps. So I know Barry's also got a Rush, and he's got that BC. He's also got an A wing. Yeah, I'm hoping to take the A wing, the Atom out to the Himalayas, and show people on D wings you don't need one. Yeah, so your your BCs and on a good day, the person I know, Rachel, or she used to have Rachel, Alice, up, would fly her BC. If it looked like a really powerful, strong day, she would go back to an A. 
because the BC would become too much. Yeah, she, she was not happy. So the simple answer to that question is where you're happiest. And there's no rush to move on. Do not rush to move on. Because the people I know have rushed to move on, they've moved on because they think they can fly farther, yeah, and they think they can fly faster. And they end up they don't because you spend all your time flying the wing and you don't spend then your time flying the sky. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, SIV. Yeah, SIV. Uh, SIV is when you feel happy to go. What, what is an SIV? An SIV is basically a course that teaches you wing control or further wing control uh, as the wing becomes uh, can become uh, into more dynamic situations, uh, bigger collapses, collapses under speed bar, uh, where you might. Um, approach the stall or stall the wing. Um, why you would stall the wing I don't know. It's quite <laughs> easy really. If on the E and A B wing, yeah, if you don't pull right down the brakes you won't stall it, it will carry on flying. Um, so my advice is don't stall the wing. But um, when would you yes. would you recommend going for an SIV? Say no, I, say I've just qualified No, I wouldn't mention I wouldn't go just after qualification. Okay. Um, can't even SIV years, courses like, can have changed. Like no, um, it's when you feel that you're you're going to fly in more dynamic air. There's pros and cons, but a lot of the modern SIV courses out there now aren't full on get out there and go and stall the back end out of your wing and do that. It's more about it's more what used to be known as pilotage or pilot progression. So they go out and they they extend the pilot at their speed and. So you haven't got to do the full course. You can do part of the course to where you're comfortable, yeah, and then work on becoming more comfortable in those dynamic situations to where you, you gain, it's about gaining an understanding of the aerodynamics of the wing. Are they good more confidence more. builders? Uh, they I'll... can be, unless uh, it's a bad <laughs> SIV course. Yeah, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go with SIV course with any Russians. <laughs> I've seen them. Yeah, that other countries. That won't, other be, countries that won't be with your confidence. I've been on a number of SIV courses, and the thing that I've found was the most beneficial of all is picking the right instructor. Yeah. yeah. Well, and there's no right instructor for everybody. It's going to be a personal choice. Yeah. Find someone you like, someone you trust, and someone yeah, who's got a history of producing good SIVs. Yeah. I mean, that goes for saying across any tuition, doesn't it? Because someone's renowned for being a good instructor doesn't mean it's the right instructor for you. Um, yeah. You know, I say to all the people uh, that come here for the first time, if you want someone in a shirt and tie, then we're the wrong flying school for you. You know, bodies yeah, and, and shorts, drinking, not drinking Budweiser. <laughs> it's after six. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a question came in from David Townsend. If an aircraft is carrying ten tons of parrots, dot, 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 Come on, David. Um, uh, okay, another question came in. Uh, how hard is it to take the wings off a fixed wing micro light? Depends how fast you go in. It's very good. It depends on the type. Um, something like a C42 is really over engineered. So, there are a number of things that are built in, like hooks on the leading and trailing edges that make life easier so you can position the wing and work it in. Uh, something like a Sky Ranger, you can get a wing fold kit which makes it even easier. It, it, it's not that difficult. Again, I'm talking about dropping the wing on the flex wing. Don't be the first time you do it when you actually need to do it. It's something you want to practice. See, and again, I had someone asking me, is it worth taking the wings off uh, whilst we're in lockdown? To be honest, every time I've taken the wings off a fixed wing, I've been more concerned about them being on the ground and what might happen to them than being on the actual aircraft themselves. Uh, you can get wing covers if you're worried about UV degradation and all of that kind of thing, but come back to the original question, it depends on the type, very much so. Pilot operating handbooks have never been easier to read. Uh, speaking to the manufacturer is not an issue and my second tip would be always have a second pair of hands. Don't be find yourself on one end of a wing waggling it around to realise that you're now stuck. Um, so really plan what it is that you're going to do and then carry it out. So yeah, taking the wings off a fixed wing, not that difficult, depends on the type of aircraft that you fly. Uh, 
Dan Yates, good tips to stop your speed bar lines, links, coming apart. You've done a video. Look at a video on YouTube. There's a video on YouTube. There's, there's, there's different that things one. you can do. Mine's the best. Little bungees to um, a little bit of sellotape to, you can weld them shut. Mine's but the best. Is it like, <laughs> that? Was I was second that actually. I watched that video the, the other day. It was yeah. very informative. Right. So yeah, the um, uh, Dan, there is a video which is very explanatory on our YouTube channel, uh, done by Barry very recently. Uh, you might even hear my dog barking in the background because he doesn't shut up. Um, but yes, the, there's videos there. Um, so yeah, rather than wasting any more time. Uh, Questioning from Danny K. Hey, eh, Danny boy. Hey, yo. Um, that is a nice one, actually. Seeing as they were very ground schooly based. Yeah. Last week we had high pressure with wide isobars, but strong winds. And yet what I was saying to you is the closer the isobars, the stronger the winds. Well, yes, you've got to bear in mind that we're dealing with the basic model. Now, actually, the centre of a high pressure can be just as strong as the centre of a low pressure. And the reason why, Andy, is this one for you? Yes. All right. Imagine you're, you're looking now from above. So you're looking out from the hemisphere. This is the centre of our high pressure, which is turning clockwise. Yeah, known as a anticyclone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My hand is the is the air, and what's the air doing? The air is coming down and falling. Yeah, so the air is being pushed down. So the air is being pushed out of the high pressure. So where you get a very high pressure and all this air mass being pushed down and out of the high pressure, especially if you've got a strong low pressure clock close by, so mm. close by here you've got a very strong low pressure, yeah, the air has been put and sucked into a low pressure, you'll get a strong wind. You will also, if you're, it also depends as well on local, as well, the microclimate, and just explain, north easterlies, north easterlies at Darley Moor, here's Darley Moor, yeah, and we've got a northeasterly coming down like this. <coughs> Here we have an area of high ground. We have the Peak District. Yeah. Here we've got Ashbourne, and here we've got two ridges leading out here. Yeah. Here you've got Alton Towers. There, eh? rubber dingy rapids, proper brother. Here we got. Yeah. And here we've got Leak. So this is the Leak Valley. So the air's been pushed down here. Yeah, and it gets pushed down and it gets blown up the Leak Valley. Yeah, so this acts like the back of an aircraft's wing or the top of an aircraft's wing. Yeah, it blows the wind round and we can end up here with very strong north easterlies. Yeah, where over East Midlands it is not affected by this. Yeah, so the wind can be a lot lighter. East Midlands is what, 15 miles away. Wind can be a lot lighter than here at Darley Moor where we're getting this Venturi effect we right about around the peak five district. Knots, don't we? we had about five knots on the northeasterly. What East Midlands <coughs> is telling us when we know it's northeast, we tend to add about five knots on what yeah. it's reporting. So if it's yeah. saying 15 <coughs> knots here and we know it's northeasterly, doing this northeast thing, we're more likely to get yeah. 20 knots. And the high pressure's up here, yeah, and you can also get encroachment this far and sea breezes and convergences as well, which can add to the situation. Yeah. Okay, we've got one that's, um, what about our two metre distances, if we could tell them <laughs> okay, our situation well, on worry. our lockdown. Well, we, uh, myself and my family and Andy and his family and Barry and uh, we have been self-isolating together since two days before the lockdown. We haven't left the airfield um, and it's only recently have we been, felt confident enough to get close to each other sort of this sort of distance. We very much uh, went into full apocalyptic mode in the first two weeks. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's probably about yeah. we've been self-isolating together. So I'm not travelling in from home because that would be an unnecessary journey. Um, I'm living on site on the airfield with my family and two kids uh, and Andy's living um, in uh, uh, on the airfield as well with his family and two mm. kids. Mm. Uh, so yes, we've been self-isolating together. And to be honest, what are we now? Five weeks in? 
Right. Four or five weeks in. Time's flying, yeah, it's been we, so we, much we, fun. We, tell you. This is about as close as we, we get to each other. Yeah. Uh, we still have the airfield on lockdown, so we don't even allow the postman on. He drops his stuff in a box and we pick it up 48 hours later. Yeah. So yeah, we've uh, we, you know we've discussed uh, on how and what we wanted to do, and obviously being and everything that together. comes onto the airfield is sanitised with ninety nine point percent some ethanol poxin and all that um, kills okay. everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and we <laughs> drink it. And we, yeah, drink it and we drink it. We drink it. Well, I've been trying bleach. I've been trying bleach. It's made me go a lovely colour. Nice pale white. Yeah. But the yeah. other day I nearly went grey. Yeah. I'll put a laser beam in my eye. Yeah. Get some, some light inside me. Um, okay, this is a question that's come in. It says, why do pilots training for a restricted NPPL micro art license need to do the navigation exam when they are limited to eight nautical miles from base? Very good question. I've got an answer. <laughs> so, uh, a restricted license or a restricted NPPL license with a micro light rating limits you from eight nautical miles from the place in which you take off. It doesn't mean that you can't take off from here and go land at another airfield that's within eight nautical miles and then take off from there and do eight nautical miles. So there is uh, an element of where we know that you probably are going to do um, an element of navigation. There is also the fear of you getting lost. So the last thing that you want to do is get up and I, and I know, do I dare say, instructors that have got lost yeah. within a few nautical miles of their home base airfield. So like I say, it wasn't handy. Um, so yeah, you know, the, the reason for the navigation exam is very important, is it's to stop you from getting lost. Um, and also at some point, you know, with a signature, you can go from a restricted license to an unrestricted license by completing uh, 25 hours, and that's, that's P1, uh, and get your license signed off for restricted. So whilst you're in the mood and going through all of your exams. To do your navigation exam, A is really gonna prepare you for the real world, that you get up and go, where am I? Um, and also, you know, you have the option of, of actually navigating within eight nautical miles. You know, you'll be able to find a, a landing site. It doesn't say airfield, it says from the point of takeoff. So, yeah, the, uh, the navigation thing, for me, would I send a student solo? Um, doing a rest restricted license without their navigation exam. No, because I want them to come back, you know, so even just basic briefing. So yeah, it's it's there for a reason um, and I, I, we can understand those reasons why. But I know where, I know the author of this question who, who's anonymous uh, and I know where you kind of rooting on that one as well. Um, okay, um, so Charlie, any thermaling or flying Tricks, stroke tips that may not be such common knowledge or practice. Where did you start? It's an app. They're going up. Follow them. Yeah, yeah. If someone's going around in circles and they're going up over there, go and join them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, what skill it's... level would be considered safe? I do not know. Safe for flying mini wings uh, and speed wings. Ah, okay. Um... There are schools that have gone through trials under the British Angle and Paragline Association, under the BHBA. There are schools that have uh, done several years of trials now teaching speed flying. Uh, so the basic how it works is when when a new um, category of flying foot comes in, schools undergo trials to actually teach that. Uh, and there's several schools, um, I think there's a couple in this country, a couple in the Alps. So my advice would be, if you want to move into speed flying, you can go into speed flying straight without ever learning to fly a paraglider. Uh, but even if you are a paraglider pilot and um, an experienced paraglider pilot, I, my advice would be to go to a school that teaches uh, speed flying. Speed wings have really taken a progression though, haven't they? I mean, I first saw yeah. speed wings out in the Alps with people on skis. That's, That's what people were doing. They getting well, some real... Well, you had all these stuff. test pilots that um, were flying paragliders and also doing kiting and then decided one night after a couple of years, you know, it'd be a really great idea to take a, a large kite, reline <laughs> it so we can fly it and we can shoot down mountains. Cause it, and it took off from there. So guys were taking off on skis, 
speed flying with skis. Uh, it then progressed the you know the guys were then in really strong winds, rightly or wrongly, were going out and sawing them. So in this country, guys were using them to saw rather than go top to bottom fast down the mountain and get some air off their skis. And then you've also then got the crossover, you've got the wings now that are neither speed wings nor full size paragliders. So you've got that crossover as well, which are really lightweight, good sawable wings. And great fun out in your dynamic airflow off the coast. And you can, or thermal one, you can, you can thermal one, they're great. You think this thing will never go up, it does. Um, but yeah, so there's just that progression. But it's that sort of, um, it's fine, how fine. did paragliding come about? Somebody standing on the side of a hill with an hang glider, and it was far too windy to fly the hang glider, and they went to the mate, I've got a Ramay parachute in the back of my car, let's get that out, shall we? <laughs> Both and off they went on Rossilli, up and down Rossilli, got a few beats in and landed on the beach. You know, oh, paragliding early was in days of paragliding. early days of paragliding from small ram air parachutes. So things sort of always take that cycle and develop from yeah, there. Yeah, I mean... Go on the course, is the answer. You look at hang gliders Go. from 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah much better. <laughs> so the final part of that is we would love to hear any funny or interesting stories you guys may be willing to share. I'm no. Joining. <laughs> <laughs> no. No, 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 not on record, is <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, Steve Wilkes, hey Wilksy, uh, what's the best music for the post lockdown Airways gig? Anything by Ollie Murders. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I don't look like No Ollie direction. Murders. I do not look he like Ollie Murders. He hates Ollie Murders. Don't Murs. look like Ollie Murders. I know you don't look like Ollie Murders. Anyway, so those of you know, I'm a drummer and is a guitarist. Um, Steve Wilkes is a guitarist. I've had the privilege yeah. of playing with Steve Wilkes as well. Wilkesy, you're on, mate. I'm definitely going to have a jam with you at some point, and I will play wherever you want to play. Something in the air by Phil Collins. Something in the air. That'd be good. Oh, maybe we could do an Airways album, all flying related. Yeah. Answers on a postcard, please. It could be Steve Wilkes wishes that he still had hair. Oh, here's another one for you. It's, they're all. Did you put a post on just paragliding sites no. and paramotor? How does P factor affect paramotors? How does P factor affect paramotors? It affects them in the same way that it affects any aircraft when you've got something spinning. So, what is P factor? P factor, the prop factor, the fact that you're spinning something. So you've got different factors, <coughs> gyroscopic. You've got a, you've got a wing that's creating lift, um, creating. So you've got torque. You've got torque this way, that way, that way, that way. Um, <coughs> more importantly, is how how any aircraft deals with that. So different aircraft deal with it in different different ways. It's like but a fixed wing. It moves the entire plane, it, doesn't it? Yeah. Know, ish. Well, yeah, it does. A, fle a flex wing on a full power, the nose is going one way, on an idle descent it's going yeah. the other way. You know, I used to have three points yeah. of tape. And the power motor does that and yeah, does that. Yeah, so there's all that. sorts of twists, but I suppose in a power motor you... Because you've got floppy lines. Yeah. Yeah, you've got... So it, it, and you've got a prop that is very close to its centre of gravity. So it's right there, it's against its centre of gravity. So you've got this torque effect. Um, depends on the power motor. And it, the, the, I think the real answer is how well does it deal with it. And when you look at the older paramotors, out there, they're usually a very high hang point, and this is one of the ways they dealt with it, is by taking the centre of gravity up here, yeah, and it dealt with it because it wasn't as close to the centre of the thrust line, so it could deal with it a lot easier. And then they started just bolting arms onto it, and they were absolutely bloody awful. I mean, never do. I've seen paramotors do that to the wing. It's like, oh god, that's scary. Um, most modern machines um, do deal with it very well, and that's why it's quite funny when people say, "I could build one of them in my shed." Yes, you could build one in your shed, but how well it would actually react under a wing is a totally different. And again, factor. the same with aircraft build. I mean. <laughs> um, Depending on what that aircraft flying machine is designed for is what they will factor in the build. So for like a, a fixed wing aircraft, um, it's designed to be most stable at cruise. So in full power, there'll be pull. And on idle, in one direction, and in idle power, there'll be no pull. So it will go the other direction. Yeah. And the same with power glider, yeah, I suppose, uh, paramotoring. The main issue being is when it's at full power, but 
do you cruise much? I mean, I'm not a paramotor pilot, so excuse me, Budweiser. Mm. Um, so, I mean, is, is it mainly factored in to be flying at cruise or, or to make No, a yeah, good power motor is factored in right across its power range, oh, that's really. Uh, um, right to the point where when it's on no power, the, the, the motor will actually stay balanced. There was motors when they weren't under power, yeah, they'd tip you like this yeah. right back. You've got to have the power on to be like this. So when you come into land and you've got your engine turned off, yeah, like normal people land a power motor, um, it, it used to do that to you. It used to tip you back, so you were like that. And like I say, most modern motors, um, they're, they're very good in torque effect under full power right through their range. They've, they've been sorted. And there's a lot of ways manufacturers deal with that by offsetting the motor, offsetting the torsion arms, uh, moving torsion arms. There's a, there's a lot of ways they do that to get that right. Um, we've got a quickie from Angus Young, <clears throat> probably one word answer. Can a flex wing spin? Uh, you couldn't deliberately make a flex wing spin. You can, like you can spin it, you can spin a hang glider. You battle to spin. Yeah, flex. you'd really have to try hard. Uh, I mean, it's supposed to be any flying machine. Depends on everything. Depends on the wing. Could I go and take a flex wing up and spin it? You've got, you've got to get the, you've got to get Wings one wing. Direction. Well, you've got to get one wing to, to fully stall. You just stall want to. right out onto yeah. its tip. Yeah. So this wing is still flying partially, but the one wing, if you're in a left-hand turn, you've got to get that wing to fully stall right out onto the tip, so no part of that wing is, is flying. Hand glider to get, yeah. But he was struck by a paraglider, so that would yeah, that. No, but you, you, <laughs> there are hand gliders that you can spin mm. if you so wish to spin them. You have to force them into the spin and you have to hold them in the spin. And to do it, as soon as you come neutral, they come out the spin, because that's what they're designed to do. Um, so I suppose if you really, really tried, there might be wings out there that you might be able to spin. I've never spun a, a flex wing Michael like. No, 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 no rush to do that. No, hang glide, just, believe me, you, you spin a hang glide, it falls out of the sky really yeah. quick. Really quick, yeah. Oh, Barry, this is uh, not necessarily a question for you, but it's certainly for your uh, friends. So a question from the guys out in India. At what point would you buy your own kit? And then new or second hand? So uh, I'm assuming this is the paraglider guys. That paraglider guys, yeah. Guys, yeah. But my advice would be to buy your kit as soon as possible. <laughs> So the question, I suppose, really is new or second hand, because you're either going to buy a kit or you're not. Well, and why yeah. would you buy it sooner? Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I, I would, because I prefer to have my own kit. Yeah. I just, I, I, that's just, whether it be a fixed wing, flex wing, paramotor, kites, I just the, like having my own stuff. The sooner you buy your own kit, the sooner you're flying the wing that you are going to be flying, flying move, moving forward away from the teaching environment where you're out on your own. So the more confidence, it all comes back to that confidence um, question, the more confidence you will have in your kit and the more understanding you have of the wing that you're flying once you're out there by yourself, it will give you that confidence to go and fly it. So the answer is sooner the better really. Uh, get to know your kit, get to understand your own kit and not the kit that's in the school, mm. even though there's a lot of And that's across the board, isn't it? You know, yeah. Flex wing, I'd recommend you go and buy your own plane. And, and yeah. uh, you know, the, I, I'm one who driving goes... Lessons. I, yeah, driving lessons. Yeah, yeah. driving lessons. Yeah, I, I, I'm just come from that background, I'd rather have my own kit. Yeah. I think the question really, though, is new or second-hand. New or second-hand. Um, yeah, there's a lot of good second-hand kit out there. Um, there's also a lot of second-hand kit that you, you wouldn't want to touch mm. as well. Don't buy it, from eBay. It, yeah. Don't buy any flying equipment from eBay. Yeah. It's, Promise me. It's a um, in this country to answer, uh, to answer in this country, a wing that is older than two years old or has has, has more than one hundred hours um, under the BHVA to be insured to fly it. That wing must be tested every year. Must be serviced every year and have a uh, a line test. And the wing porosity test that makes sure that the wings is within manufacturers uh, specifications to fly so it will retain 
the flying characteristics it should have for its class of wing A, B, C or D. If you don't have it done, you're not, the insurance falls away. You know, you're not insured. It becomes, because if it hasn't been tested within manufacturer's testing protocols, then it is no longer certified. So you're not insured to fly an uncertified wing. So if you're buying second-hand kit, my advice is only to buy one that has been tested for line shrinkage, has had line snap tests for strength of lines, for wing porosity, and has come back. Uh, come back. That's as, for you. A, it's, like, it's like buying a car with an MOT. Exactly. exactly. You, know, you, you can buy a car with no MOT, but why would you? Yeah. You know, and a car that's got more MOT or a wing that's just been serviced or a plane that's got a permit that's just had its inspection, you know, you've got that backup of a third party as opposed to someone who just happens to know how to sell ice to Eskimos. Yeah. And bear in mind that, you know, if you're looking at buying that first load of kit, whether it be paraglider, paramotor, flex wing, fixed wing, whatever, um, you've got a budget and that you, you want to work towards. The person that's selling it wants to sell you that kit don't just go and buy the shiny red one because it happens to hit your budget. Um, you know, it's very easy to be led down the garden path and, and miss buy a lot of stuff. I keep coming back to it because we get asked the question, speak to your instructor. You know, if you're in a school and you're learning, regardless of what it, of type now, you know, GA or anything, you know, if you're interested in purchasing a, an aircraft or some form of flying kit, Speak to someone that knows, not to the person that's trying to sell it to you. Um, I mean, that's good advice just in general, isn't it? Yeah. Buy this, why? Because it's what we sell. Yeah, early, early days pilots haven't got the knowledge to be able to tell whether something's good exactly, or not. Yeah. I bought my first aircraft when I'd done 10 hours of tuition. No idea what I was buying, and no, <laughs> no idea. But I bought it because I wanted that particular one and it was in the price bracket. You know, you're buying on budget as opposed to, yeah. you know, you might, you, you might not you put an extra 500 quid to it and you'll get twice as good a, 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 a kit than you were going to go, but until someone tells you. So, yeah, speak to an impartial person. Christ, give me a call. Give Andy a call, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, someone like Andy um, who, who comes, who do have a lot of second-hand kit and deals in a new kit is more likely to be able to do you a better deal. Um, and you know certainly your instructor if he's got a plane would more than likely sell you something that they're prepared to get in because they're probably going to have to um, so yeah it can be a bit of a bottomless pit. and, and uh, a good bit of advice is do not go out on, on eBay and buy a wing no. then bring it to me and say <laughs> will I fly it for you because no. I don't like being rude to people <laughs> no. yeah the answer is no my, my, yeah. Every problem that I've ever had has been from that one. <laughs> yeah. Mark, can you just go and check this plane's all right? Oh, I'll go then, shall I? No, no, but I won't. I uh, okay, so... so... Gordon Rigg, our oh, blessing, Gordon Rigg. Uh, have you considered a sub-70 kilogram flex-wing microlite? Yes. Um, I have. So this, the question is, would we... Buy one or would we fly one? Yeah, I'd definitely fly one. They're all definitely fun. fly one. Yeah, fly one. I was tempted. Would I buy one? To be honest, for the first time in a long time, that new PB uh, that's been pushed out by Flylight was the first time I thought, oh, I want one of them. And, we, and I can fly nine different aircraft in a day. Uh, that's the first time I've thought for a while I want one of those. So, yeah, why not? I, we fly for fun. Uh, and that's the main reason that we fly, you know, we're not trying to get anywhere because someone's paying us. We, if, if a sub-70 gets your rocks off, then great. I know people that fly around in, in cruisers that do 140 knots and they're doing it because it does 140 knots. You know, when I, when I do get a chance to go and fun fly, it's normally about 20 minutes after the end of, you know, nine hours of uh, instruction. So do I want to go and get my rocks off? Do I want to go that far? Do I want to, you know, I'd, yeah. Yes, yeah, and you can thermal the PB. Yeah, it's a great light little wing. They are yeah. fantastic. Yeah, great Very fun. Well yeah. So yes, Gordon, um, I have considered a sub seventy flex wing, uh, and yeah, I probably would buy one to be honest. And we got a lie come up from Giles that said Andy never, never, never booed. 
<laughs> no, I'm not. Mm. So, so, so. You've, you've never asked me to fly a wing that you brought on eBay. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, anonymous one coming in. What's going on with UK airspace currently regarding Class D changing to Class G? Well, to be honest, um, the circumstances have changed. Um, and I'm aware of this, a, number, a huge portions of Manchester airspace recently went from Class D to Class G between a set number of hours, I think it was from half past nine at night till six o'clock in the morning and Birmingham I think is also going to Class G temporarily very very simple, um, a lot of um, operators, so the guys that would be air traffic controllers have been furloughed uh, obviously there's an element of social distancing that they also need to do so the teams that are actually in the stations are massively limited they're, they aren't getting the coverage and also air traffic I don't know if any of you have looked up uh, recently zero contrails in the sky what's your theory on contrails? Uh, so there's the less demand as well so in order to offer some kind of service um, obviously it's limiting. When they can't offer any service it's been reduced to Class D so it is still therefore uh, uncontrolled but irrelevant because we can't fly anyway. <laughs> so yes if you're a commercial pilot flying IFR um, you know slightly different but uh, for us it doesn't yeah. really matter. I mean, the, the, it happened. It'll go, it'll go straight back to class D as soon it as... It, and it's between set number of hours and their upgrading kit. But, I mean, it was like when the volcano uh, went up ten, eight, ten years ago. When well, Austin blew up. Yeah. I mean, uh, we, as I nearly said, we were touching going on Manchester. We weren't. We were allowed to fly down the runway at Manchester. But if we touched the, the tarmac, we were going to be charged a landing fee. You'd be surprised on how long two and a half mile go around can take. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we only did that about two or three times. Well yes, you know, um that's it. Yeah, that's really cost you uh, space unrestricted. Basically basically the they've unrestricted it saying to the commercial operators that this airspace you've got to accept that it's now being unrestricted and we can't take your traffic. No not it's not being monitored. It's no, not no, being monitored. No. I think you're still being told to squawk the conspicuousy yeah. code. So there was still an element of control. So if they did need to get in touch with you, at least they knew you were listening. Mm. Uh, but again, if I was transiting any airspace, um, then obviously you want to research that. Don't just assume that you can fly through it. Um, and, and definitely, Woody, have a look at the requirements for Class G airspace. Um, okay, uh, questioning from Matt. How would a plane on a conveyor belt take off? Come on, Matt. Depends if you had the brakes on it. I'd be in second. I definitely. I think I put it in second just to get rid of that. I'll, I'll put it, well I'll, when I'm air towing, um, if especially the um, the I'll, I'll put off in second on the grass, or if it's wet on the asphalt, I always yeah. pull off in second anyway to stop the wheels from spinning. Yeah. Um, if it's dry and I'll run on a conveyor belt, I'll actually be. I'll put in third. Mm, well, I'll put good. in third. Yeah and straight away slam it into fourth and yeah, yeah you could probably take off. Because you, yours is double clutch, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Double clutch, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Hope that yeah. answers your question. Yeah. Auto yeah, just yeah, stick it into drive. D for daytime, yeah. innit? Dump, you're off. <laughs> D for daytime, I love that nerf for night. It didn't go anywhere. Yeah, mine hasn't got an end on because I can't even fly IFR. Uh, uh, sorry, I can't fly uh, VFR. VFR. So I haven't got a, I haven't got an end for night time. No, no, but I have got an R for race. Race mode. Yeah, I've got race mode. I'm all done, innit? Any other that stupid questions? Good. We can give you plenty of stupid answers. <laughs> okay, a question came in from Georgie. Uh, suggestions for your Q&A. If you could plain, explain the difference and pros and cons of topless and king posted wings. This is trikes and hand gliders, really. Trikes and puppet. It's puppet. Is it from a trike? Pilot? It's from a trike pilot, but the it's I mean from a, a trike pilot. Uh, I haven't flown a topless um, trike. They're really quick. Yeah, they're fa hence the name. Well, well yes, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they are faster. You've got a huge reduction in drag anyway mm -hmm. uh, from cables and things which aren't very aerodynamic. All of the workings are actually inside of the wing, so there's a slight change in the way that the billow shift works. There are rods to hold tension in the wings, uh, and it's a lot more cables and pulleys yeah. as opposed to... You've got sprogs move. rather than inside the wings, they've got sprogs that move rather than uh, luff lines 
Yeah, and because the wing, when it's sitting still on the ground, um, the tension's taken up in your top wires. Yeah, when it's flying, they're quite loose. Um, so you have to have structure within the wing yeah, to, to be able to take that weight when it's sitting on the ground, which means uh, with the hang glides, usually carbon spars. So you've got these carbon spars. So the wing ends up being heavier. Um, and of course, on the on the flex wing micro lights, they have rather than having wing wires, they have solid, what well, sort of down tubes or, or uprights depends oh. which part of the world you're from. Yeah, so you've got. A oh, part, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, instead yeah. of a wing yes, wire, yeah, yeah, yeah. you've got yeah. a solid yeah. structure. Yeah, um, they're, they're they're quicker. I found uh, it I a bit don't know if it was more stable. But yeah. the the reason for it being more stable was because I was able to trim it out. Yeah. So where the wing wanted to fly faster, I could trim it to a slower speed. So therefore it was a lot harder in roll, uh, which made it, the aircraft obviously a lot more stable because the environment couldn't move the, the trike around. Yeah. Is there much trimming on a hang glider? Yeah, yeah, you, you've got a VG, yeah, you've got variable geometry within the wing that you can pull on off. That's just, just not on toplesses, that's within a lot of the hang glider wings. Um, they're harder to land. Because they are quicker, yeah, they're faster. Yeah, they're faster. So they're quicker like coming in at yeah. seventy odd, aren't you? <laughs> but once again, it, it's, it's about wing progression, isn't mm. it? And what you're happy to fly. So it, it's that gentle progression through wings and understanding, going through the learning process of flying different wings, to a point where you think you feel you would be happy flying uh, a topless wing. Okay. So, a uh, quick one from Kai. I'm assuming he's asking this for everybody else, but not for himself. Can you get carbicid in a power motor? Yes, you get carbicid in a power motor. It used to be quite common uh, within uh, within power motors, and it's pretty well. It's not been totally sorted, but it, you still get carbicid because you're dealing with a a venturi carb. So your carburetor is shaped like so, and you you've got a butterfly within it like so that goes from being closed virtually closed on tick over, tick over to being fully open on full power so what happens here is the air is being sucked in to your carburetor yeah being sucked through and this correct this area here the air speeds up creates an area of low pressure and sucks fuel in that mixes goes in and creates the bang so these are basic Venturi carburetor where the fuel is being sucked in under full power. So you get a, a drop in pressure through the Venturi effect, through the speeding up of the air through the car. Um, so what happens when you take a gas and you lower its pressure? What happens to its temperature? The temperature goes down as well, so you've got a drop in temperature. And the drop in temperature can be as much as 30 degrees C through a venturi carb while sucking all that air mass through on full power so the answer is yes if you take a day that's quite a pleasant day say it's 20 degrees yeah humid i was going to come to that one 20 degrees yeah and so the temperature inside that carburetor with very simple maths it can be minus 10. now on a cold day Let's say we've got a nice crisp winter's day where the air's, <coughs> excuse me, really cold. You know, it's like zero degrees, a couple of degrees below. Obviously, uh, colder air doesn't carry as much moisture as normally. So on a warmer day, you can expect perhaps the air to be have more humidity in it. So on a really warm day, let's say it's 28 degrees, yeah, so the temperature is only minus two in that carb, I say minus two, but there's a lot of humidity. So the one thing you do need for carb icing is humidity in the atmosphere. Yeah, it's sucking moisture through the carb. So even at minus two on a 28 degree day, and let's face it, in the UK, that's a pretty darn nice day, but it's very humid. Full power takeoff, you're on full power for two, three minutes while you're in the climb, getting a nice climb out away from the airfield so you don't upset our next door neighbours. And off you go there. 
and yet then you come back to cruising speed and the engine starts spluttering a bit and what happens is you tend to get a build up around the butterfly any surface that can the moisture can catch on to and as you come back to cruise that then freezes up and you've got your car ice and, and the engine stops Boom. a lot of people get confused on when they're going to get car icing it's not on that winter day yeah. it's more likely to be on a hot and humid day uh, the modern paramotors with the air boxes on creates a more equal pressure within the air box and, and that has really helped not only in noise reduction but also in carb icing and one top tip if you've got uh, a lot of motors have rubber housings between here and the engine or between here and the air box yeah check your rubber and make sure that there's no gaps developed or there's not a split in it if you get a split you'll be surprised how you'll get carbizing when you normally don't mm. very quickly because it affects the pressure within the carburetor yeah and you get you get carbizing quite quickly so the rubbers are quite important actually I, I found that the guys that are getting carbizing usually the the rubbers perished a bit and they got a bit of a split and it's changed the pressure there you go so yes <coughs> yeah it's eight o'clock is it yeah well one more question yeah from Michelle and Katie Okay, yeah. It says, what time are you finishing? I'm hungry. Now. <laughs> Guys, thanks so much. I mean, yeah. I have another page and a half of questions. Uh, so thanks for hanging around. I hope we've answered some of the questions for the guys that are watching. Uh, we might have to revisit this. Uh, I'm pretty sure with the questions we got here uh, and by the sounds of government advice, we probably will revisit Q&A. <coughs> Um, so again, I hope you've really enjoyed what it is that we've done for you today. If you do have any other questions, if you'd like to see more videos, then get over to YouTube and subscribe. We will be back in the foreseeable future, can't say it'll be two or three days, but we will be back. We'll certainly make it public knowledge. Um, and again, thanks ever so much for watching. So it's good night from me. It's good night from him. <laughs> Stay, <laughs> Stay safe. safe. Stay well. Stay at home. <laughs> and don't drink.